We are now recording this program, and again, welcome to our second program on our primer on nursing home quality standards. This is going to be a standalone program, just like the other one was a month ago, and by that I mean that you don't have to have participated in the last one in order to hopefully benefit from this one. They should both be, both be useful to you. Everyone, again, has been muted, uh, so if you want to unmute your line at the end, actually, I'll unmute um, people at the end. You can press star, I take that back, sorry about that. Uh, at the end, when we have questions and answers, you can press star six to unmute yourself. But otherwise, I'm gonna leave everyone muted. There's also a box on your screen, which should be uh, for you to type in a question if you have a question that you want to type in. And then we're always available to try to help people and provide some uh, technical assistance, et cetera. You can email info at ltccc, Larry Thomas, Carol, 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 dot org. And without further ado, we're gonna get started. I'm gonna just, uh, since many of you are familiar with this, but I wanted to, for those of you who aren't, um, this is the Long-Term Care Community Coalition. We are a nonprofit organization. We are entirely dedicated to improving care and quality of life for residents in nursing homes and assisted living and other residential care settings. We do a, most of our focus, excuse me, is on policy analysis and systems advocacy in New York and nationally. We provide a lot of information now on our website, more and more um, to equip consumers and families and ombudsmen and advocates and, and, and uh, which are providers as well on what's going on in nursing homes in terms of staffing, in terms of antipsychotic drugging, in terms of other indicators of quality and safety in nursing homes. And then we also do a lot of work more and more uh, programs such as this to educate consumers and families, uh, long-term care ombudsmen and other stakeholders. And I'm very proud to say that we're home to the local long-term care ombudsman program for the Hudson Valley in New York State. So thank you to all the ombudsmen there who have joined us today. Please don't forget again to take the survey if you are a volunteer ombudsman in the Hudson Valley and elsewhere uh, in New York to take the survey at the end of the program. And this is just, we, um, we provide the names of people who take that survey and who have participated in the program so they can receive credit. Um, some of the local programs provide credit, others don't. Check with your supervisor. Uh, lastly, I am Richard Mollett. I've been with the coalition since 2002 and I've been the director since 2005. So what are we gonna be talking about today? On the left-hand side, you could see this is our primer on nursing home quality standards. Essentially, we were um, speaking with some managed care companies. As uh, many of you might know, managed care is increasingly playing a role in access to long-term care services, including in nursing homes. And we found, this was several years ago, that many of the managed care companies had never been in long-term care before and were not really aware of the standards and other requirements related to nursing homes. So we put together uh, this primer uh, several years ago, and it was really geared to the, towards those managed care companies, people that would be working with their uh, you know, beneficiaries to help guide them to hopefully good nursing home care. And then we revised the primer for residents families, ombudsmen, and others. So it's really a more general primer now rather than, than just being geared to the, um, to the insurance companies. And then we updated it earlier this year to reflect the new regulatory standards that came out. Uh, importantly, everything that we talk about and everything that I always talk about in any programs or materials that we have, uh, unless otherwise specified, there, it's always based upon federal law and federal regulation. So this is really applicable wherever you're getting nursing home care. Now the primer itself is available in the learning center of our website. You see the orange bubble on the lower right hand side of the screen. Again, that's www.nursinghome411.org. Just click on the learning center and you can find the primer there as well as a lot of the other materials that we'll talk about and that hopefully will be useful to you. So this is essentially the uh, table of contents for the primer. And what we did is it's, a, it's posted in a PDF file. 
And all of these the pieces of the table of contents, they're all uh, hyperlinked to the actual pages. And what I wanted to do is to make it as easy to use and as useful as possible to people who are not working on these issues every day. So the point is, for instance, if you look at the beginning, um, we talk about uh, the second uh, major piece, assessing nursing home quality with nursing home compare. We have a summary of the federal law. We have a summary of government regulations and oversight. But the bulk of the primer is looking at standards, you know, some of the many standards out there that we've identified as most important to quality care. And for each one of these, 1 through 49, you can see uh, you know, a short descriptive title. So you can just scroll down here if you're concerned about something in particular. For, um, for instance, the uh, number 41, if you can see my arrow, is drug regimen reviewed monthly. So if you, you or your resident has an issue with, uh, with drug regimen, you know, with the medications that someone is getting, you can come to the primer. You're free to download it uh, uh, and use it any way you like and share it. Uh, and you could see, just click on where it says 40, and it'll take you right to page 40, and you would see what you're interested in. Uh, similarly, like look at 39, residence care supervised by a physician. Now, I know that's a, that can be a significant issue for residents where their care is not being supervised by a physician. Maybe they're not seeing their physician uh, as much as they should. So you could find out what the resident's rights are uh, in that respect as well. Uh, I'm not going to speak too much about the next couple of slides. These were from the first program, but I just wanted to include them again here to let you know what's in the primer. So we have some information about how to find out about nursing home quality, et cetera, in, um, in your area or in your state, online it is. And then we also talk about some other resources. As I mentioned earlier, we have a number of resources on nursinghome411.org. For instance, we just posted for every single nursing home in the country by state the uh, payroll-based journal staffing data. This is something maybe we'll do another program about in the future. This uh, just came live in November, and the latest data that we just posted about a month or two ago was for the last quarter of 2017. So you could find that information about any nursing homes staffing, uh, any nursing home, excuse me, that has reported. It's been a federal requirement now for several years, but not all nursing homes are in compliance. The large majority are, but if you don't see your nursing home, it means it's not yet in compliance or it's not providing data that are, um, that have been verified as accurate. So, but otherwise, all that is up there. We put out information, as I mentioned before, on antipsychotic drugging, on uh, enforcement actions, uh, et cetera. And then another good website, especially if you are a, um, you know, looking at things at perhaps a um, higher level or, or if you want to look about for a specific nursing home, ProPublica, which is a nonprofit uh, investigative journalist um, organization, they have a nursing home inspect page. And there you can search citations uh, for nursing homes for specific keywords, for specific nursing homes, uh, et cetera, and you can find out what is going on in your nursing home or nursing homes in your community. So uh, I'll start today uh, really with a background of the nursing home system. Again, you know, we, we usually start off with this just to refresh and to get everyone kind of centered on what we're going to be talking about. So. Virtually all nursing homes in the United States participate in Medicaid or Medicare. Participate is the word that the government uses, meaning that they take some amount of Medicaid and or Medicare. Most nursing homes, the vast majority, take both Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, Medicaid pays for most long-term nursing home care. Medicare pays for most short-term rehab care. Now, in order to participate in Medicaid or Medicare, a facility signs a contract saying that it agrees to meet the standards provided for in the federal nursing home reform law. And that's, again, everything that I talk about, unless I specify otherwise, is based upon the nursing home reform law and the regulations that come out of the reform law. And that's what we're talking about today. States can have additional protections 
uh, beyond the reform law, but a state cannot have any less protection. So again, anything that you hear me talking about and every single thing that we're going to be talking about today is the right of every single nursing home resident. Resident, excuse me. As I say in the next bullet, federal protections are for all residents in the facility, whether their care is paid for by Medicare, Medicaid, or private pay. I don't care if it's a low low reimbursement or high reimbursement. It doesn't matter when a nursing home signs a contract and participates in Medicaid and or Medicare. They are saying that for all of the residents in the facility, they are going to be providing this level of service. Now, just very briefly, the federal agency, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, it contracts with the State Department of Health or the state, um, uh, uh, usually it's the Department of Health, sometimes it's the Department of Public Health, um, but, you know, it's a state health agency, and that agency generally pays for nursing home care on behalf of CMS you know, for Medicaid and Medicare beneficiaries, and it also is responsible, that state agency, for ensuring that residents are protected and that they receive the, the care and the services that they need and that they deserve. And that's all, again, laid out in these standards. There's, there are many, many standards. We're only going to be talking, well, the Primer only talks about um, just under 50, and we're only going to be talking about a few of them today. The goal of today is, one, to focus on some that I thought were really uh, useful and interesting, but also to give you a sense of how you can just pretty easily, I hope, use that primer and other materials on our website in your own advocacy and improving care, whether you're a, you know, sometimes we have nursing home owners and nursing home operators and, and workers that, that join us as well, so and you're more than welcome. These, these materials are useful for everyone, I think, to help them to advocate to improve care for their residents or for themselves or their resident. Uh, so, again, very quickly, I just want to go uh, a little bit through the background. So, the federal law, the nursing home reform law, says that every nursing home resident must be provided the care and quality of life services sufficient for that individual to attain and maintain his or her highest practicable physical, emotional, and social well-being. Uh, importantly, and those of you who have um, attended our programs before, uh, I've heard this, and I, I apologize, but I just think it's so important. It's not highest practical. It's not that the nursing home says, well, I'm getting paid $200, $200 a day for you, I'm getting paid $800 a day for you, and this is what I want to be providing to you um, based upon how much I am paying myself, if I'm making a profit, if I'm making a high enough profit, et cetera. It is saying that when I accept you as a resident, when I take you in, I am saying that I will provide services, care, monitoring, et cetera, to ensure that you can attain your, the, the, the best that, essentially the best that you can be. Um, so if I go into a nursing home and I couldn't run a mile, four minutes or otherwise, it's not expected that the nursing home will help me run a, run a mile. But if I go into a nursing home and I'm able to go to the bathroom with some assistance and help getting out of bed perhaps or out of a chair and walk to the bathroom, it is expected that I won't be put into a diaper, that I won't become incontinent because there was not enough staff to help me do that. Uh, I know that these are some of these, some of these standards are challenging. I mean, if this was happening, there'd be no reason for us to have this phone call. There'd be no reason for my organization. There'd be no reason for what ombudsman and others do. The fact is that, you know, for a lot of residents, clearly these standards are not being realized. And I know that it can be challenging and frustrating. I've been a family member myself several times, and of course, uh, I'm an advocate, and I feel very strongly about the work that we do. I think that it is really important to know what rights you have. And if you don't know what rights you have, then you are definitely not going to be able to realize them. But if you know what rights you have or what rights the people with whom you work have, then you can advocate to make that happen. And again, it's not easy. I'm not saying that it's easy, and I know that it could be 
challenging and frustrating and sometimes even painful, unfortunately. But I think it's really important what we want to do in programs like this and in our materials is to help people understand what their rights are so that they can realize them, both in their nursing homes and then for those of us who do more uh, general or policy or systemic advocacy, um, just um, you know, very general in the states and, and in the country. So uh, a little bit of background also at the very bottom about the reform law. The law passed in 1987. Regulatory standards came out in 1991. And those standards were in place until 2016 when CMS, again, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, revised those standards. So the standards were revised in 2016, and they're being rolled out over a three-year period. We've done programs on this, and I'm sure we'll do a refresher later on this year. Uh, some concerns that we have, uh, just a, as an aside, are that the, um, the, the Trump administration is planning to revise those regulations again. So even though they haven't all been implemented and we haven't yet seen what is, uh, you know, what is happening and how they're affecting resident care and resident safety, the plan is to revise those regulations again. And the reason for that is because the administration is uh, essentially uh, is, is doing what the, what the nursing home industry lobbyists have asked, which is to reduce what they call burdens. So we don't have time to get into that. I apologize. We do have a lot of materials on our website. If you go just to the front page, you can see we put out some recent materials, uh, including a congressional briefing and some other elder justice materials that we put out in conjunction with other organizations, including Justice and Aging, National Consumer Voice, California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, and the Center for Medicare Advocacy to help people understand what is going on. But I did want to mention that, that we're talking now about regulations that we were revised in 2016 that are being implemented. Most of them were implemented, and everything we talk about has already been implemented. It's already the standard. There are a couple of things that, are, that they're holding off until 2019, but we are facing the possibility of some uh, further changes that could be, frankly, very threatening to, um, to resident safety and something about which we are very concerned. Uh, just before I move on, if you are interested in joining our, our for our alerts, excuse me, you can email info at ltccc.org, Larry Thomas, Carol, 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 dot org, and we'd be happy to add you to our list. We don't share or sell it with anybody, or sell to anybody, and um, you would get alerts from us in the future about um, programs like this, as well as what is going on with the federal regulations. So, moving on to the prompt, to the primer, excuse me. Um, what we have here, and this is just a page from the beginning of the primer, it tells you exactly what the structure is. I'm just going to spend a moment here about the content. So uh, if you look at number two, if you're able to see that on your screen, for each standard, like we did in the table of contents I mentioned before, we have a descriptive title, meaning that you can see what the basic subject is of that standard and how to get to it. We also include the applicable section of the federal code and when it's available, and excuse me, the, the uh, corresponding FTAG. So the FTAG is, and I discussed it a little bit below, the FTAG is how the, um, how, how the regulation is cited in the federal system when the nursing home is cited for having a violation. So for instance, uh, I don't remember the new, new F, FTAG, unfortunately. They were just revised in November. But uh, historically, it was if someone was given chemical, was put on chemical restraints, excuse me, and so they were given drugs to sedate them inappropriately, that was FTAG 222. Why do I include that? Uh, and why do we include the uh, section of the Code of the Federal Regulations? Because I want people to have uh, the resources. I want people to know where they can go to find out what the law is, that it's not, you're not just counting on me or something that we put out to say, this is a right that I have, um, this is something that I want to attain in my nursing home with my residents, that it all comes back to, again, the federal regulations, which is based, which are based on federal law. The F tags are also important because if you're looking at a, what we call a statement of deficiencies for your facility, those are written down in 
respect to F tags. So it's important to have that. And we have the full list of F tags at the end of the primer. So you can easily see that there. So I'm going to move on now to some of the sections that I thought were worth highlighting, and that'll be the rest of the program. The first general area about which we'll be speaking uh, relate to dignity and quality of life. Uh, CMS recognizes how important dignity and quality of life are, and I worry sometimes that uh, too often we don't because we're so worried about clinical care and we're so worried about the medical services, et cetera, that a resident is getting or not getting that we forget about dignity and quality of life. And certainly, you know, basic safety, cleanliness, um, you know, medical services, medication services, et cetera, are of paramount importance that, that can't be overstated. However, dignity and quality of life are essential as well. And CMS does recognize that, and I think that they recognize that even more in the new regulations a bit than they have in the past. And the reason for that is, one, that's what we pay for um, when we pay nursing home for care. Two, that's what we all want and expect for our lives and for the lives of our loved ones, that we can live with dignity. Uh, I used to say when I started working for the coalition and I was in my early 40s, that, you know, if I can go to the bathroom by myself, um, I'm going to want to continue to do that, you know, if I'm in my 90s or, or you know, 80s or 90s or whatever point in time that I'm in a nursing home, if I'm able to do so. And now I'm in my mid-50s and I still feel exactly the same way. If, you know, there may come a point in time where I can't do certain things. Maybe I'll have had a stroke or heart disease or, or, or whatever that, that, you know, don't enable me to to ambulate, et cetera. However, for as long as I can, if I can go to the bathroom with help, I'm pretty sure that I'm not going to want to be put into a diaper. And so that's, you know, and, and that relates, and this is important as well, is that things like that quality of life really does relate to clinical care. Because when someone is put into a diaper, just to use that example, there is a, a high risk that they'll, they'll develop pressure ulcers. There's a high risk that they'll, uh, you know, from skin breakdown, et cetera. There, there, there are other risks, risks, excuse me, involved to their clinical well-being. So they really do go hand in hand, and that's why I think that they're, they're both so important. And I would say lastly, before we move on, I know when I go to a nursing home, uh, I have never been to a facility where the, the quality of care for residents was really poor. And people were just not treated very well. They're going to be slumped over in wheelchairs, and there were call bells going off, being unanswered, and you know, residents sitting in, in diapers and half exposed, et cetera. I've never been in a facility like that where the clinical care was excellent. I think, generally speaking, at least in my experience, that the dignity and quality of life services, the quality of those services goes pretty much hand in hand with the quality of the clinical services. So I think that is useful and important information to have for us as residents, family members, uh, ombudsmen, and others who work with residents that they, they really can't be easily separable. So this is, and what I've done through most of this is I've copied exact pages from the primer so you can see what it looks like. So here, looking down at standard number 12, and then on the lower right-hand side, standard number 13, I want to spend some time and, and, and show you and talk, you know, talk with you about what is there. So you see, again, this is dignity, number 12 on the left-hand side. And then in the um, brackets, I have 42 CFR 43.10A1. Not stuff that you have to remember, but again, I want people to have a way to refer back to the code, I mean, you could be more interested, you could want more information, but most importantly, that it's not just, you know, that, that LTCCC said it or that Richard Mollett said it, is that these things exist. And virtually everything um, in these um, uh, that I include here are, is taken directly from either the regulation, as you can see in italics here, or it's quoted from the guidance, the, the interpretive guidelines, for nursing homes and for for the inspectors 
as you can see here as well. And then you'll see on the right, I included uh, in, in that little bracket are the uh, is the F tags as well, the new F tags, F550, F557. So if you are looking at your nursing home and you see that it was cited for F550, you could open up this PDF, do a search for F550, and it should take you right here. And then you could find out, well, what were the standards? Um, what should I be thinking about as a family member or a resident or a member of a resident or family council, et cetera, and in terms of what is going on and how is my nursing home addressing it? So there's a lot of, I think, useful ways. Importantly, and I know that the programs that we do tend to be very um, content heavy. Again, this is free. It's available. There's nothing that anyone has to memorize. I really want to plug in with you all to see, well, this is where you can find some information. This is how you can find out things about concerns that you have in the future that might be useful. So you don't have to remember everything we're going to talk about, interpret guidelines, blah, blah, blah. It's explained very briefly, as I noted at the beginning of the um, program, and then you could easily search for it within the primer and find it, um, hopefully right away and very easily. Uh, just one last thing before we move on to talk about the substance of it. So you'll see, hopefully, at the end of this 12, there is number 28. That's the footnote at the bottom, because I also included the the older um, code to the excuse, citation, excuse me, to the code of the federal regulation, CFR, and the FTEG number. Because if any facility was that was inspected before November 28th of 2017, it would be, and it was cited for dignity, it would be F241, this number at the bottom of the page. It wouldn't be F550 or F557. So, uh, and if you go to Nursing Home Compare, where I referred, um, uh, which I spoke about in an earlier slide, and you looked at earlier inspections, you would see that it would be F241. And, you know, by the way, nursing homes also have their inspections that are available to the public and residents and families and ombuds, et cetera, on site. So you can look at them there as well. So let's move on to the substance. So here you can see we, we have the topic dignity, and then we include an exact quote from the regulations. A facility must treat each resident with respect and dignity and care for each resident in a manner and in an environment that promotes maintenance or enhancement of his or her quality of life, recognizing each resident's individual, individuality. Excuse me. The facility must protect and promote the rights of the residents. Uh, and important here, and I emphasize this, and those of you who are lawyers on, on the um, program today, must. So when we, you know, we speak about language, must is not may. You, know, you, you may be able to do certain things, or you must. Must is a command. Must is this has to be happening. It's a very concrete requirement. And then, you know, to flesh that out, because, well, what does that mean? Um, the guide, you know, the guidance or the guidelines, as we state here, um, will generally flesh out. And the guidance is, I want to say, I know Charles is on the line, um, but I have everyone muted. I think the guidance is about 700 pages. But what we tried to do here is, again, to just include pieces that we thought were most relevant. So here I say the interpretive guidelines state, each resident has the right to be treated with dignity and respect. All activities and interactions with residents by any staff, temporary agency staff, or volunteers must focus on assisting the resident in maintaining and enhancing his or her self-esteem and self-worth and incorporating the resident's goals, preferences, and choices. When providing care and services, staff must respect each resident's individuality as well as honor and value their input. I mean, this to me is really tremendous. Uh, you know, it's as if I wrote it uh, as as a consumer advocate and as a someone who's been a family member. But this is what the federal government is saying. I mean, this is why nursing homes are paid a substantial amount of money to care for residents is because it's not a hostel, it's not a you know YMCA that they are paid again you're between two hundred to over $800 a day for residents to ensure that, that residents are receiving 
care based upon their needs and quality of life services based upon their needs. And again, I know I said it before, but I, I want to reiterate that I know that these are challenges, that a lot of facilities, you know, I think the vast majority of them have are very institutional and very top-down, so they're not really focused on the resident in this way. They're more focused on what the administration or what the owners, maybe even, you know, from another state or from uh, another county, you know, from outside of the facility, are saying um, should be the practice, are saying should be the staffing levels, et cetera. But no, I mean, what we're trying to get back to here, and by trying I, I mean that the government is really demanding, is that the facilities that everyone, temporary staff, regular staff, volunteers, are focusing on the resident and on assisting the resident where he or she is, you know, meeting them, you know, looking at what the resident's goals are, finding out what they are, and, and working to, to meet those goals. So there's some good examples here that I included. So examples of treating residents with dignity and respect include, but are not limited to, encouraging and assisting residents to dress in their own clothes rather than hospital-type gowns and appropriate footwear for the time of day and individual preferences so a resident should not be in a bathrobe all day long. I mean, unless they want to. It's their right, it's their home, and they can do that. But it should be based upon what the resident wants, not that everyone is is dressed in the same way, that everyone is in a hospital gown, et cetera. That is clearly not appropriate. Um, include, these, are again, are not my examples. They're examples from the Census for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, includes placing labels on each resident's clothing in a way that is inconspicuous and respects his or her dignity. It includes the next uh, large bullet on, um, on the left-hand side, promoting resident independence and dignity while dining. And this, is, I know, is a big issue for a lot of, a lot of residents, including avoiding daily use of disposable, disposable excuse me, cutlery and dishware, bibs or clothing protectors instead of napkins, unless a resident you know, chooses that, would prefer to have that. Staff standing over residents while assisting them to eat. Staff interacting, conversing only with each other rather than with residents while assisting with meals. So this is, you know, I just want to stop right there. When you think about it and when you go into your facility, whether as a resident or a family member or an ombudsman, uh, that you know, look around. When you go into a dining room, is the, you know, if a resident needs help, if there are residents who need help dining, et cetera, are the staff that are helping them, are they, stand, you know, are they sitting next to them? Are they operating at the same level or are they standing over them? Are they talking to the resident and engage with the resident or are they talking over the residents to other staff members or are they looking at their phone, et cetera? And what the federal government is saying here is that we expect that residents are going to be served and treated in a way that recognizes and um, and helps them to maintain their dignity, et cetera. Uh, and then the first paragraph on the, the first non-bulleted paragraph on the right-hand side, staff and volunteers must interact with residents in a manner that takes into account the physical limitations of the rest of the resident, excuse me, assures communication and maintains respect. And I just kind of got at this. For example, getting down to eye level with a resident who is sitting, maintaining eye contact when speaking with a resident with limited hearing, or utilizing a hearing amplification device when needed by a resident. And then I, I, I put everything in bold. I mean, this was their language, but I put a, a, a lot of this in bold. Uh, and I note that dignity is a critical issue for nursing residents, one, as I mentioned before, which is important both in and of itself, and also it significantly affects a resident's physical and mental health. So following are some relevant excerpts from the survey procedure section of the state operations manual. So what we tried to do here, as I mentioned, you know, on the, looking at the first page, we first had the quote directly from the regulations then we pulled out information from the guidance, which explains the expectations. And then we have some information. What I, what I did was I went through all of that. Um, and we looked to see, you know, what is valuable? What do we think 
that people will want to see that they can pull away uh, that will be of uh, interest and will make a difference in how they can advocate for themselves, you know, if they're residents and for their residents, if they're family members or ombudsmen or other advocates, et cetera. So here are some examples um, from the survey procedure section. This is what the, what the federal government is saying that state inspectors should be looking at. Observe if staff show respect for each resident and treat them as an individual. Do staff respond in a timely manner to the resident's request for assistance? Do staff explain to the resident what care is being provided or where they are taking the resident? Is the resident's appearance consistent with his or her preferences and in a manner that maintains his or her dignity? Do staff know the resident's specific needs and preferences? Do staff make efforts to understand the preferences of those residents who are not able to verbalize them due to cognitive or physical limitations. And, you know, for instance, of course, we're talking about people here with dementia. That people with dementia should not be treated as if they're a lost cause. And unfortunately, and very sadly, that, that too often happens is that, but it's important to know, and we've discussed this in other programs, and we surely will again, that all those so-called dementia-related behaviors, that's a form of communication. And what CMS is saying here is that the facility and all facility staff should be trained and, and be putting into practice processes to make sure that they are understanding that they're, as someone at CMS said to me a couple of years ago, actually it wasn't to me, it was, at, it was at a larger program, but he said that we expect that the nursing homes are meeting the residents where the resident is, where he or she is, whether it be cognitively, whether it be in terms of physical limitation, whether it be even physically, as we just talked about here, that the, that the staff person is not standing over the resident, they're, 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 they're kneeling down, they are meeting eye to eye with the resident. And every which way, is that, this is again, you know, you're not being paid, nursing homes aren't being paid to produce socks or, you know, or, or, or to pull oil out of the ground. They are being paid to care for people who are often very vulnerable. So it's really important that these, um, that these protections are there and that they are implemented in the lives of residents. So we're going to move on to number 13. Uh, and again, we'll stop at the end. I'll leave time for, for questions, and we can certainly uh, you know, try to respond to questions as well by, by email. And if people have suggestions with certain things they want us to talk about in future programs, let us know as well. But so moving on here, number 13, lower right-hand side, you can see the orange arrow, self-determination, right to make personal choices. I, I included that here because I thought that it was, obviously it's important, but I included it in today's program because I wanted everyone to see how things, one stems from the other. So you see, you know, they're talking about dignity. They're talking about some very, you know, very specific ways in which we understand how we all want to be treated how we all want to live and how it is the nursing home's responsibility to realize that. But here moving on is that it, it, it goes, you know, it goes beyond that. So here's self-determination, right to make personal choices. The resident has the right to and the facility must, again, not may, not can try to, the facility must promote and facilitate resident self-determination through support of resident choice. And that includes the resident has a right to choose activities, Schedules, this is going to come as a surprise to people, including sleeping and waking times, health care and providers of health care services consistent with his or her interests, assessment, and plan of care. The resident, number two, has the right to make choices about aspects of his or her life in the facility that are significant to the resident. Moving on, three, the resident has a right to interact with members of the community and participate in community activities, wait for it, both inside and outside the facility. I don't know how many times I've said, you know, when I've had questions from people about wanting to leave the facility, the facility, a nursing home is not a prison. And people have the right to have relationships with people outside the facility and to go outside the facility. Uh, it does not mean that the nursing home has to arrange for a limousine 
for someone to go to a park. Um, but it does mean that the facility has to help the resident to make arrangements or make arrangements for the resident, uh, enable them to get out of the nursing home, enable them to go places that they, they want to go. And there are a lot of services out there that can help a resident or someone who has, um, you know, physical or other needs to go out into the community. Uh, and then moving on, um, according to the state operations manual, the intent, and this is in quotes, the intent of this requirement is to ensure that each resident has the opportunity to exercise his or her autonomy regarding those things that are important in his or her life. This includes the resident's interests and preferences. And I'll just highlight and talk about some of the things we highlighted here. The guidance says it is important for residents to have a choice about which activities they participate in, whether they are part of the formal activities program or self-directed. Next paragraph, residents have the right to choose their schedules. And I know this is, I know this can be very, very challenging. So I, I again, don't want to say that these things are easy. What I do want to say, as I mentioned earlier, is that we cannot we cannot advocate for things. We cannot advocate for our rights if we don't know what they are. And by advocate, you know, sometimes we we um, we advocate, you know, very aggressively. We you know we talk to people uh, in the state government. We talk to people in federal government, et cetera. But this can also mean just taking uh, you know a copy of this, or, or taking if someone has an iPad or a phone, et cetera and showing it to staff or showing it at a care planning meeting and saying, how can you help me make this happen? I, I know that I have as a resident or as a family member or as someone who is working, a geriatric care manager or ombudsman who is working with residents and families, how can we help our residents make this happen in their lives? And that just in and of itself can make a real difference. But, you know, the scheduling I think is so important. And here it says, you know, right, again, residents have the right to choose their schedules. This includes but is not limited to choices about the schedules that are important to the resident, such as waking, eating, bathing, and going to bed at night. Choices about schedules and ensuring that residents are able to get enough sleep is an important contributor to overall health and well-being. Residents also have the right to choose health care schedules consistent with their interests and preferences and information should be gathered to proactively assist residents with the fulfillment of their choices. So I hope that, that that comes across. Again, this is not my language. This is language from the federal guidance. So facilities have to be proactive about this. It can't just be that they, you know, that they schedule things without bringing the resident in to decision making about that schedule. Or if the resident Again, you know, this applies to people with dementia or other um, cognitive or, communi you know, communication limitations, and then their families or others who know them should have the opportunity to participate in planning for this. So if someone who had dementia maybe can't say that they were a late sleeper and they like to sleep in, um, but perhaps, you know, as a result, they're getting awoken, waking up, excuse me, at 7 a.m., and they become very agitated because they can't express that they like to sleep in, but speaking to a family member, speaking to the, you know, or, or trying other things with the resident when a resident is having behaviors as a result of being awoken in this, in this you know, situation, that that is, again, something that is expected that the facility and the facility staff will be proactive about. And it says here, the last sentence in bold, Facilities must not develop a schedule for care, such as waking or bathing schedules, for staff convenience and without the input of the residents. So it's very, very clear here. Now, again, I know these are challenges. A lot of the challenges, of course, as many of you know, firsthand relate to staffing. And from my perspective, again, these are Typical challenges. It's not easy to change the culture of a nursing home. It's not easy to change the practice of a nursing home, but it's a way in which we can move things forward. And it gives us a ground, as, I, as I've said a number of times now, to advocate for change in this respect. And this is something that a family council or resident council 
can use, I think, very powerfully to try to uh, try to improve what is going on in their facility. I'm going to move on, but again, uh, and not not cover the rest of this page. But again, this is all on the primer. It's all available on our on the Learning Center of our website. If you don't have it already, um, you're welcome to download it and to share it. So I'm going to talk about a few more standards here under dignity and, re and respect. Um, reasonable accommodation of needs and preferences this is number 14. The right to reside and receive services in the facility with reasonable accommodation of resident needs and preferences, except when to do so would endanger the health or safety of the resident or of other residents. So it, a lot of this really gets to how how the environment is maintained, um, furniture, a uh, resident's personal belongings, etc. cetera. Uh, number 15, activity programs must meet individual needs. I'll just include here what I have in bold. Activities should be tailored to meet the physical, mental, and psychosocial needs of each resident, including those with dementia. Uh, and as I, you know, I'll often say, bingo should not be the only activity that's available. Um, that the, and this is again, is something that the resident councils and the family councils and ombudsmen, the people that are that are uh, organized within a facility or working with people in a facility, can really help to make um, a difference on. So I just wanted to give you an example here before we move on. This is one of the fact sheets. So uh, for those of you not familiar, because we do uh, some, we've done some trainings around the fact sheets as well, is that for a lot of these standards, we have a fact sheet. And the fact sheet, are, our fact sheets, excuse me, are also in the Learning Center of our website, nursinghome411.org. But you can see here what I tried to do is to really bring it down into a, a two pager. Every fact sheet is you know, front and back, two pages. And you can see what the standards are. Again, in purple, you can see I, I included in brackets the citation to the code and the F tag. So you have that there. It's not just what LTCCC says. And we talk, you know, we include residents' rights um, in terms of dignity and respect, how they can exercise those rights, what the intent was of the regulation according to what the federal agency says. And then on the right-hand side, I include, we spoke about some of these examples, examples from the federal guidelines to support your advocacy. So we try to make it between the primer, which provides you, you know, a broad range of information, to these individual fact sheets on many, not all the standards, many of the standards, we have um, fact sheets that you can see and use this. And this is something that, you know, we would welcome and encourage you to use in family councils, resident councils, and other trainings as well. Uh, I'm going to quickly go through because I know we're, we are close to um, the end of the hour and I want to make sure I leave time for questions and answers. Um, I wanted to include here, you know, at first when I was when I was doing this and we had a really terrific intern at the time who um, was a law, was in law school, excuse me, and he went through the entire um, code section that it relates to nursing and went through every single standard to identify ones that were um, that we thought were important to residents' rights and, and quality, et cetera, uh, and most important because they're all important. But number 16, medically related social services, like, well, what does that really mean? And then I realized that, and I, I've included it here in the box on the left-hand side, it is the responsibility of the nursing home to identify a resident's needs for these services and ensure that they are provided. That's not my wishful thinking. That's what the federal government says. And you could see, you know, some of the examples that we provide, resolution of resident grievances, making arrangements for obtaining items such as clothing and personal needs items, um, assisting with informing and educating residents, their families or representatives about health care options and ramifications, helping them to transition if they want to leave the nursing home, um, providing arranging for needed mental and psychosocial counseling services, etc. And then I think the last one under, that we're talking about in this area is a safe and clean environment. And this gets also to that the nursing homes should be providing an environment that is as home-like as possible. And interestingly, I think I talked about this on, included on the next page, that you can see, uh, and this just includes uh, you know, some of the things that they would want to see eliminated. I'll, I'll flip up again for a second. So 
some of the some practices, this is just above the bullets, that can be eliminated to decrease the institutional character of the environment include, but are not limited to the following. This is not my language again. This is language from, from the federal agency. So some of the things that can be eliminated to make the nursing home less institutional include overhead paging, meal services using trays, you know, institutional signs labeling workrooms and closets and areas that are visible to residents and the public. Because again, it's the resident's home. Medication or treatment cards. Um, the widespread and long-term use of audible chair and bed alarms. Because a lot of what you see when you go into a facility, you hear so much noise. And you can imagine how hard that would be to live with, especially if you have someone, you know, if you're someone who has dementia and you not, may, may not be sure about what's going on. And to have just a lot of alarms and commotion, noise is, is not, is, is, is certainly not good or helpful. Continued here, large centrally located nursing care team stations. So it notes here, um, the third, you know, the third paragraph, many facilities cannot immediately make these types of changes. So CMS recognizes it. We're not, CMS is not saying you have to remove a nursing care station or you have to remove medication cards immediately or you're going to be penalized. What they're saying is it should be a goal for all facilities that don't have these types of changes to work towards them. Uh, so, so really important. And we are seeing, it's actually just reading this morning, that there are new nursing homes opening, uh, you know, around the country. So when we talk about nursing homes being, uh, nursing homes being opened up, when we talk about nursing homes that are doing, a lot of nursing homes that I visit are doing, you know, a lot of work to, uh, to clean up or to restructure, et cetera, that that should be included. And, you know, we strongly recommend, of course, um, talking to resident, residents and families and resident councils and family councils. And this is something that those who work with residents and families and resident family councils, like the ombudsman, can really help and, and promote. So the last, you know, shortest section that I wanted to get to today related to a few of the standards around assessment and care planning. And I included them here. I wanted to include them in our you know, program on the primer because it was uh, when, I, when I've done some family council trainings over the years, and I know Gilbert and, and Charles are both on who, who I work with closely on those, the, um, the assessment and care planning materials, I think, were the most popular. They really seemed to strike a chord with people. So I wanted to include them here. So again, you see, this is taken from the page of the primer. I just copied them over. 18, resident assessment. The facility must conduct initially and periodically a comprehensive, accurate, standardized, reproducible assessment for, of each resident's functional capacity. And it gives you a whole list here of the things that they are expected to look at. Demographic information, the resident's routine, the resident's cognitive patterns, vision, mood and behavior patterns, and of course, clinical issues, et cetera, activity pursuits, skin condition, dental and nutritional status. Dental, you know, dental care is always a big issue. And then number 19 on the right-hand side, the development of comprehensive care plans. And what I will often tell, you know, when I speak to family members, et cetera, is to me, resident assessment and comprehensive care plans, it's kind of a one-two punch in, in essence, in terms of getting good care. Is that one, the assessment has to be meaningful. It has to include all of these things, this is, these are, again, the federal requirements. And then the care plan must be based upon the assessment. So you really have a, an idea here very clearly and in writing in the care plan of what the resident's needs are, not just clinical, but also psychosocial, what their activities they want, what, what their customary routine is, et cetera, and how the facility is going to be meeting those needs. There's another section also included, that included two different uh, regulatory requirements around comprehensive care planning. So this gives you even more information. It also talks about who should be included, and that should be the attending physician, a registered nurse with responsibility for the resident, a nurse aide with responsibility for the resident. So this is something a little bit different from what CMS had required in the past. It's one of the small tweaks they made, I would say, in 2016, is that they really uh, wanted to see 
that the care planning included people who are familiar with the resident, both clinically, what he or she needs, and also what the resident likes and doesn't like, and his or her patterns, et cetera, so of living, so that the care plan can be responsive to that. And then lastly, we have this fact sheet again. We have a couple fact sheets because people were so interested in resident assessment and care planning and because it's so important. This is one of the fact sheets that we have, it's all available on our website. But you can see, as we look at the left-hand side and the green box, use this checklist to identify what is important to you when you have a resident assessment. And I thought that was, that was really, I hope it's really useful, is that you can see here what I did was I just copied what the federal what CMS, the federal agency said, and I said, you can use this. So, you know, I'm, I, I want to be realistic. You know, you may not get to 18 different things. However, you can make sure that you know what you want to talk about, that concerns that you have are addressed in a meaningful way. So these, I think, could be really, really useful, again, for residents and for families and resident family councils, et cetera. Uh, last time, all this is free and it's all available on our website. So I re we really welcome people using and sharing. Uh, I just wanted to mention we also have, this is a picture of our website, we have um, uh, issue alerts on many of these issues, including baseline care plan, which is one of the new requirements in the federal regulations, but some of the other issue alerts we have here. And you can see on the left-hand side, this is all under the Learning Center but we have information and data on nursing homes, as I mentioned before, on staffing. We have an action center, um, which we just put a new alert up for, news and reports, et cetera. And then we have some specific information for our home state, New York, and for the Hudson Valley Long-Term Care Amazon program. So thank you very much for joining us today. I'm going to open up. I know we, we ran close to two, so I apologize for that without getting time for Q&A, but I will stay on the line. I just want to remind people again, well, first of all, our next program will be September 18th, so I'm really, really happy to say that we received funding to uh, start, start the programs again on a monthly basis, and we're going to be doing that in, in September. So if you're interested in being on the list, please email info at ltccc.org or call 212-385-0355. We usually post uh, everything you know, our programs on Facebook and Twitter as well, so you're welcome to join us there. Uh, for ombudsmen in New York State, again, if you're a volunteer ombudsman uh, and you would like us to let your supervisor know it, that you attended this training, please take a quick survey, surveymonkey.com. Um, and you can also find this, again, this program is on the website right now. So you can go to the PDF of the program and go down to this tab if you can't see it here. And then for family members in New York State, there's a terrific organization that I'm very proud to work with called the Alliance of New York Family Councils, www.anyfc.org, and they are doing some really terrific work and helping family councils and family members to create and strengthen family councils in their nursing home. So I am going to now open it up for questions. Please press star six if you have a question and I'll be happy to answer. Hi, does anyone have any questions? Yes, I would like to know how to take a survey. Uh, 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 uh. Sure. So somebody asked how they could take a survey. Again, if you go to, I have the, the uh, page up right now. It's surveymonkey.com forward slash r forward slash ltccc dash ltcop1. But if you go to our website, you can download this PowerPoint and just go to, to that page and you could see it right there and you could actually probably click on the survey monkey. But in any case, um, that's it. I know it's a little hard to, maybe hard to read on your screen, but you can also download it from our website. Uh, again, please press star six if you have any questions. Sorry, I just muted and I muted everyone. So if, again, if you have any questions, please press star six. Okay. 
Well, thank you all very much for joining us. Again, I'm really happy that we're going to get started again uh, in, on September 18th uh, with new programs, and I wish you all a wonderful summer. Thanks. Bye-bye.